Uh, welcome to the uh, 6 p.m. press conference here on the CZU complex. My name is Jonathan Cox. I'm the deputy chief for CAL FIRE, San Mateo Santa Cruz unit, and the line officer here on this incident. Uh, just as always, if you can uh, mute your telephones, take any conversations outside the press briefing area, and keep your masks on at all times, it would be greatly appreciated. I uh, just wanted to set a little bit of context again. I know we did this a few days ago. Uh, this evening we can report that across California, uh, since August 15th, uh, 1.25 million acres of land have burned in the last uh, just over 10 days. Uh, to give you a sense of uh, point of reference, that's larger than the state of Delaware that we've seen consumed in the state of California uh, over that period of time. Additionally, uh, across the state, there are still over 136,000 people evacuated from their, from their homes and communities. Uh, and there's over 100 aircraft uh, assigned specifically to fight fires in the state uh, at this moment. Uh, with that, we've uh, dropped over 2.7 million gallons of retardant uh, on, that, uh, on these fires over the last uh, 10 plus days. Uh, and obviously, uh, there's additional resources coming in from throughout uh, the Western uh, United States to help us fight these fires. A little bit about the specifics of the CZU complex this evening. Uh, we can confirm that the fire is up to 79,640 acres. Uh, as we spoke about the other day, this number is going to get more and more specific as time goes on as we gain better intelligence. We have good news in the sense that we are up to 19.19% containment on the fire. Uh, as, you, as you know, every, cent, every percent of containment uh, is hours and hours of uh, sweat and, and blood up on those lines actually getting containment uh, on, in, in the fire perimeter. Uh, as far as uh, the number of structures threatened, there are still over 24,000 structures that are threatened uh, on, uh, throughout the complex. Uh, and we unfortunately can confirm this evening that we are up to 443 structures that have been destroyed uh, on this incident. The breakdown of that specifically, 11 of those structures are in San Mateo County and 432 in Santa Cruz County. With that, we are now up to 1,697 uh, uh, personnel assigned to the incident. Uh, and this, this afternoon, about 2 o'clock, uh, working with the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office and Santa Clara County Fire Department, uh, the first evacuation warnings in Santa Clara County were lifted on this incident, which is a sign of progress in the right direction. Uh, with that, we're very lucky this evening to have an honorable guest, uh, U.S. Congresswoman Anna Eshoo. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, well, it's been quite a day for me. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to um, uh, be driven uh, uh, from the uh, uh, sheriff's uh, office in Santa Cruz County with Sheriff Jim Hart, our outstanding sheriff. Uh, uh, saw firsthand uh, the emergency operations center uh, that is housed in, uh, in his building, and it was room after room after room of teams, uh, whether... Uh, they are law enforcement, uh, fire, you name it, they are there. Uh, we went, I went to the um, evacuation uh, center uh, at the uh, county fairgrounds. I think every person in this entire region, I wish they could see what the team has done. In less than a week, they really established, set up a community. And there's been an outpouring from the community in terms of uh, clothing, food from restaurants, um, uh, really a medical center uh, that has been uh, set up. Uh, all across um, this effort is the teamwork that I see taking place. Uh, it's one thing to, for me to be working the phones, calling the DOD, calling the state director of OES, uh, talking to the National Guard, all about assets, assets, assets. But to be on the ground and to see firsthand what law enforcement, together with CAL FIRE and all of the other uh, agencies in the county coming together and working seamless, seamlessly, um, I would say this is, this is really a picture of government that is working very, very well for people. Uh, it's moving. It is uh, heartrending in some situations. Um, I don't know what it feels like to think that I might lose my home. Uh, and I, I try to imagine it. 
but everyone that is part of this team that's standing in back of me, those that are standing in front of me, they know what it is. They know what it is. These are uh, first-rate professionals. Uh, I think that the progress that has been made is really quite remarkable. Uh, for a number of days, we were at zero percent uh, containment. Then we inched up to three or four. When I saw eight, my heart leapt, and you just heard the report. Uh, and uh, uh, we had something to eat, just not all that far away. And there were not only blues there, there were orange, orange jumpsuits. Uh, and those are the individuals from the California Department of Corrections. Uh, they too have been trained in firefighting. Uh, not that many people know that, and I didn't. Um, and although they're not here, I want to thank them uh, for doing their fair share as well. So I salute all of our first responders, uh, the real heroes in our country, truly the heroes in this community. And um, God willing, God willing that the weather cooperates, uh, they can do their work. And the percentage of the containment, I think, will continue to increase. And uh, we will keep welcoming the news of, um, uh, of more people being able to go back to their homes. So uh, I have to tell you that I have, uh, uh, I'll be going home this evening with a much higher level of confidence uh, than I had when I was driving over the hill uh, to come to visit. And uh, I want to thank you all. This is, um, this is not easy work. Um, and uh, I call it God's work uh, because everyone is in service to the people in this community. And this community is a very tight-knit community. They all know each other. And um, so, uh, uh, God willing, we will continue this progress. Uh, but for everything that you, um, uh, that you uh, made me aware of today, showed me firsthand, answering all the questions, I salute all of you and I thank you. And thank you, Sheriff Hart, for making me your guest. The poor man kept saying, come on, come on, you have to stop talking, we have to keep going. So thank you for your patience and for, uh, for the, uh, uh, the hospitality that everyone has um, uh, extended to me. I'm proud of the people of my district, very proud. The courage of the residents, the courage of the firefighters, the courage and the dedication of the people that are taking care of each other in such a professional and caring way. Uh, it is, um, uh, it is, uh, it, it brings great credit uh, to this congressional district. I think it's an eloquent statement about it. So God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Speaking next uh, from CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 3, Operations Section Chief Mark Brunton. Good evening. So another very positive day, another progressive day that we've got a lot done, a lot of work out on the line, a lot of success today. Again, the weather is cooperating with us. We've been uh, steadily getting uh, doer uh, reinforcements, a lot of personnel. As soon as we get them in, checking in, we're putting them out on the line. We're putting them at, to work in our, our plan, and we're having a lot of success with that. So uh, I'd like to just take you around the horn with the fire really quickly. Uh, again, up in uh, Division uh, Golf and Kilo, uh, we have a really good line established. The fire is back down to that line. It's being in more of a patrol status. And what's very uh, critical and important about that piece of line was that was one we were concerned with that, would, that might drive into potentially Santa Clara County. As you heard earlier, that the, uh, the evacuation warning has been lifted, and that's in, uh, because we have a uh, very good confidence and we have a good control on that part of the line. So a lot of success there. That's been a lot of days in the making. Uh, moving around to Branch 1, uh, the, those uh, communities such as Pescadero, La Honda, Lamar, uh, fire is creeping down there in, in, in Butano, but it's doing exactly what we want. It's part of our str uh, strategy. So although it may seem that the fire is burning, it is, but it's simply creeping down to our control lines where we can take best advantage and use our limited resources to, to extinguish that and, and make that safe and make those communities safe where uh, we can start talking eventually about a repopulation plan. Uh, moving down the coast, uh, some of the fire is mit self-mitigated in the lighter fuels uh, and due to the, the uh, humidity and the, the marine influence. So that's really a good, good thing, especially moving down uh, to the community of Davenport, uh, looking really good there. Uh, fire is, is kind of hung up in the hill. 
so we're just going to wait for the weather conditions to, to change slightly so it, it, we can take advantage of it, bringing it down to our control line that we have established around that community. In the south here, holding very well. This has always been a concern for us so that the fire does not progress in a southerly fashion to uh, threaten the community of Santa Cruz and the UC campus. Uh, again, our control lines that we've established and our secondary control lines, still valid, still working. The fire has uh, bumped into some of that and extinguished and exactly what we wanted to do. And so we're looking really good, high level of confidence in that there are line uh, in our suppression activities there. Uh, around the community of Felton, uh, we're working diligently of uh, we burn in some line uh, around about half to three quarters of that community. Uh, we have another line that we're establishing and going to do a, a burnout operation uh, probably Thursday, looking at the uh, conditions are going to be right for that. And uh, once that's completed, then that's really going to put a really good buffer, a really good line around that community of Felton. And that'll give us a high level of confidence that that community is going to be very safe uh, from any sort of oncoming uh, fire front. Moving up uh, towards Ben Loman in, in the state park, we, we've got, uh, again, one of our challenging areas, the topography, the fuels, and so forth. That's an area that we're working diligently in. We're putting a lot of resources in. It's just really tough, difficult terrain to work in. And so, again, we've used our uh, alternative strategies uh, to, to mitigate that issue and, and to have success in that. And in the coming days, I think we're going to have a lot of success. Uh, moving up into Ben Loman, Boulder Creek, uh, those communities are, are still looking really good. We have a lot of resources working in and above those communities up in the, the hillside. Uh, again, tough, steep terrain to work in, but uh, we're, we're having day-by-day -day success and we're, we're getting those control lines established. Uh, moving into uh, Bonnie Dune. Um, again, that's looking fantastic. I was up there again this afternoon. Uh, we're seeing a lot less smoke. We're, the crews are in there working very diligently. Uh, working around the structures, like I said, it's a painstaking process, a lot of homes, and with our limited resources, we have to go almost home by home, uh, putting line around it, securing it, mopping it up, making sure that it's safe uh, in that community, and we're having a lot of success on that, that uh, venue. We have a lot of the uh, utility companies starting to move in and starting to start uh, developing their plans and starting to do work uh, to start reestablishing the infrastructure that's going to be needed. And until the infrastructure is established, set up, repaired, um, then we can start looking at a repopulation. And that's any of these communities. So we're aggressively, as soon as we can get it safe enough for those folks to move in, then it's, we're bringing them in, and they're starting their, their hard work. So that's really good. Uh, as far as the continuing challenges we've, always ha we've had with the folks that have been evacuated and have been causing us uh, some concern and hindering some of our operations, um, I want to thank uh, Sheriff Hart and his staff has done an outstanding job of, of policing and they've gotten in there and I got to say it's the first time in over a week that we've got up there and it was almost a ghost town and that's what we needed uh, because now my crews are in there unhindered doing the work they need to do they're not distracted to to perform rescues or any of the other things or, or concerned uh, concern about their safety they're just getting there nose down putting in the hard work to make that, that community safe our air program, our aircraft we're flying again today. We're timing out our aircraft means we're flying to the maximum we can. Uh, water dropping as of uh, just about an hour ago. Uh, we were at about 195,000 gallons that have been dropped today. Uh, we still have a few hours left of, of flight time, and so we are going to at least meet or exceed the amount that we dropped yesterday. That was 200,000 gallons. That's a lot of water dropping. That's in support of our crews on the ground and working together. Uh, we're getting that much closer to mitigating this incident and uh, getting folks closer to getting back home and this fire being uh, put away and put to bed. Uh, speaking next from the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office is Chief Deputy Chris Clark. Good evening. So continuing along that same theme of positive news, uh, really this is uh, the second operational period we've had without seeing any arrests. Uh, and so I really think that's a testament to, to the saturation that your deputies and your officers have been doing, the, the saturation of policing effort within the San Lorenzo Valley that we didn't have to make an arrest today. In terms of numbers, uh, as I mentioned, today we had, about, we had 76 officers in total uh, patrolling the, the San Lorenzo Valley. We'll do that again tonight with roughly about the same number, 66, uh, with 18 from our office, 18 from our in-county partners, and then 30 mutual aid from over the hill. In terms of calls for service, we had four welfare checks that our office responded to, as well as 13 suspicious uh, person calls. 
Um, in terms of, there's been a lot of outpouring of support for the firefighter who had his wallet stolen. Uh, just today, the sheriff received uh, calls from as far east as New York. And I think everybody's just as disturbed as, as, as we are with regards to that kind of that kind of thing. But uh, our detectives are making uh, some significant progress in that, and so we hope to be able to uh, to share with you more information as, as that goes along. Uh, in terms of uh, folks we did contact, we did end up uh, contacting three different people that we cited for being in a closed evacuation area. Uh, in terms of missing persons cases, uh, some positive news on that front as well. So yeah, uh, this morning I reported we had a total of seven missing persons cases. Uh, today we were able to locate two of those folks, so we're, now we're down to five. So five missing, missing uh, people total. Uh, there's three of those cases are from the Bonnie Dune area, one from Ben Loman and one from Boulder Creek. And again, our detectives are working uh, throughout the throughout the day uh, and into the evening to uh, to locate these people and try to figure out exactly where they are. As you meant, as you heard earlier, the evacuation uh, notice was lifted for Santa Clara County. Uh, just again, a good reminder uh, to to uh, to focus on uh, you know resources uh, like uh, Cal Fire's website, our Facebook for information with regards to uh, to information concerning our county. I bring that up just so people aren't confused between the two counties and the evacuation order being lifted in Santa Clara. Uh, another thing, so in putting ourselves in, in, in your position, again, and I've mentioned this before, where we, we have our own staff, members of our own staff that have been, uh, that have been displaced by the fire. And so, uh, and some in areas that are very close to where the, the fire is actually burning. And so if you're, if you're there at night, if you're there tonight and you're wondering, uh, well, how do I know if my home's been damaged? How do I know if my home's okay? So the county's created a website. And really what you do is you go to this website, you put in your address, and you'll be able to get some information, whether or not your home's okay, damaged, or, or, or destroyed. Hopefully not destroyed, but uh, it's, a, it's a resource for you to be able to go to to get more information. So I want to give that to you real quick. So, that's Santa, so the, the website is santacruzcounty.us forward slash fire recovery forward slash damage assessment map. And follow me on this. Uh, it's dot A-S-P-X is in x-ray. So that's, I mean, I apologize for the lengthy web address, but santacruzcounty.us forward slash fire recovery forward slash damage assessment map dot ASPX. Thank you. Speaking next from the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office is Sergeant Zuno. Good evening. Uh, for San Mateo County, uh, access to the evacuation zones uh, remains restricted. Um, we understand, like uh, Deputy Chief Clark mentioned, we understand that many of you are very anxious to know what's going on with your properties. Um, we're asking the people to please continue to be patient with us. Uh, please do not go to the evacuation centers or to the security checkpoints to ask on the status of your property. Uh, we understand you, that you're very anxious. However, the staff working those locations, they do not have the information. Um, we are working with multiple agencies to inspect the areas that have been damaged and to identify hazards. As this information is available and as, and as we gather information on your properties, we will put it together and make it available to you and we will also let you know how you can uh, get that information. Um, uh, some, of, some members of the community have asked where they can make donations. Uh, for now in San Mateo County, the San Mateo Event Center is collecting supplies for uh, for babies uh, specifically they're asking for diapers uh, and baby formula and they're also collecting uh, sc school supplies for students uh, they can be dropped off at the san mateo event center monday through friday from 10 a.m to 3 p.m and for now they're asking that only these items be donated also for those uh for those in the uh, lastly uh, in regard to the uh, evacuation zones, we don't have any reports on, uh, on any uh, suspicious people or looting. We've been hearing rumors about that, but right now, uh, no arrests or, or people caught do, uh, conducting any looting in those areas. And lastly, uh, for those in the agricultural business, um, I have a contact number for you with the San Mateo County uh, Ag Agricultural Commissioner, and that is 650-363-4725. Thank you. Speaking next and representing all of the Unified Command Agencies is CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 3, Incident Commander Billy C.
Uh, good evening. Obviously, uh, another successful day. Uh, increasing the containment up to 19% is uh, tremendous for us. Uh, my team hit the ground running uh, last uh, about seven days ago and uh, built a plan, executed that plan, put the resources in place, and have been able to uh, accomplish 19% containment on this incident while evacuating uh, with our law enforcement partners over 77,000 uh, people. It says a lot about this area. Everyone's been very uh, hospitable, cooperative. Um, obviously, our firefighters have been working very, very hard to uh, protect all their assets and all the unburned lands so far. This incident's impacted uh, several people. It's a, firefighting is a dangerous uh, uh, situation to be in. Uh, wildland firefighting, especially here in the Western United States, is very dangerous. You hear a lot about our aircraft uh, flying. We timed out our aircraft uh, three shifts in a row now. That says a lot about our safety record out there, our personnel uh, organizing and orchestrating uh, that aircraft, uh, both our fixed wing and rotor wing assets out there. Over the course of the last month in the air world, in the wildland firefighting, uh, we've lost uh, two tanker pilots on July 30th in the state of Nevada. We lost a helicopter pilot last week in uh, western Fresno County. And just yesterday, we lost a helicopter pilot um, up in Mount Hood in Oregon. It's a dangerous profession. Uh, we take every opportunity to insert every safety mitigation to ensure the safety of our personnel, both on the ground and in the air. So just be advised, we're out there doing the best we can, keeping everyone safe, both the public and our firefighters at all times. Thank you. And our final speaker this evening, Local CAL FIRE Unit Chief from the San Mateo Santa Cruz Unit, Chief Ian Larkin. Good evening. Um, we're making progress, and uh, I appreciate the assistance from the uh, Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department uh, to mitigate those, uh, those issues we were having in some of the areas of the fire where we had uh, uh, civilians in there uh, uh, causing havoc and uh, kind of getting in the way of our operation uh, to make our uh, uh, success of uh, protecting structures and... Uh, uh, containing the fire with uh, perimeter control. Um, as Chief C said, today was a good day. We've made progress. We're at 19% contained. But I just want to reiterate that it's a dangerous situation, as he alluded to. We have a lot of uh, heavy timber that's been burning for 10 days now. And uh, that heavy timber is going to burn out at some time. It's going to come down. So we have trees coming down all throughout the fire perimeter, uh, on roadways, on private property, um, throughout the entire uh, fire area. So. Uh, it, it's still a dangerous situation, so having the public uh, uh, repopulate that is just not a, a, a available to us now until we get this uh, area uh, secured and safe for uh, reentry. Um, since the uh, damage inspection teams are making a significant progress um, and the county has released their uh, uh, application to show uh, homeowners uh, what the status is of their property, uh, I just want to give a, a few uh, details of some uh, assistance uh, for those folks that may have had damaged property or destroyed property um, so they can uh, they can start the process by uh, getting ahead of the uh, the curve if they're able to uh, confirm their property has been damaged by going to disasterassistance.gov that's disasterassistance.gov uh, these are resources that will help them get started in that recovery process uh, also um, they can download the FEMA app um, they can go it's uh, available on Android and uh, Apple platforms um, and once again, that's the FEMA app. Or they can call, if they don't have the ability to download the application, they can call 1-800-621-FEMA. That's 1-800-621-FEMA. Uh, with that, uh, I just want to thank everybody, uh, Chief C and Team 3, for the effort they're putting forward. Um, I want to extend my uh, appreciation to both the San Mateo County and the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department the true interoperation uh, coordination that's going on between the multidiscipline agencies is uh, of the most uh, professional manner that I've ever seen on an incident that I've been on. Uh, the collaboration and cooperation is just outstanding. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to be a part of that and uh, work towards the mitigation of this incident. Thank you. All right, happy to take any questions. Is there an immediate or imminent threat here? 
And either way, when should people expect to be able to return uh, to Scott Valley and these areas far from fire in particular? Yeah, so the question is related to imminent threat for evacuation areas and when can people expect to return. So for firefighting, as we've seen on this fire, until we have line that's established around the fire perimeter and that line holds for over 24 hours, that's when we feel comfortable actually calling something or, or an area contained or a percentage containment. Uh, and as Chief Brunton mentioned, the terrain on this side of the fire on the kind of southeast corner of the area it's uh, you know, almost vertical timber with three feet of uh, forest duff underneath. Uh, and to create a line in that area is not simply running a bulldozer through it. It's hundreds and hundreds of hours of work for those firefighters on the ground. So you know, I, I think we want to get people back in as quickly as possible. The team is focused, uh, has dedicated an entire team for a 24 hour a day operation to work on repopulation and re-energization and, and all the plans that are necessary. Um, uh, but with that, we're not going to sacrifice uh, potentially putting people in harm's way. Robert Aldana with Max Scott Valley. Quick question, and you may have referenced this, my apologies if, if uh, I, I missed that, but as we stand here, we see the Felton area, behind Felton area. Um, we've got a lot more smoke and activity there. Can you speak to that? Any specific concerns that you have, or is that kind of, you know, can you speak to that? Please? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll get the expert up here. The, the question was really in relation to the area around Felton, and uh, uh, Chief Brenton will be able to answer that. Certainly, uh, with the clear skies, we uh, have a front row seat. And what you're seeing there with the smoke, uh, quite a bit of smoke production is a, is a matter of a couple things. One, as I said, some of that terrain is very inhospitable. It's, it's really tough to work in. So part of our strategies is to build our control lines and to let the fire slowly work its way down to those control lines, uh, and, and then we can extinguish it. Um, and then we may be doing it based on, again, certain weather conditions, certain fuel conditions, and also certain topographical uh, conditions that will establish the line, let it burn to a certain point, and then we will uh, introduce some fire in a very controlled fashion to eliminate that threat and thereby create a good buffer zone. Uh, and that helps um, expedite that whole process of making a control line. So what you're seeing now is we are in a process I would anticipate that process being within the next 48 to 72 hours um, where we were going to have success. We'll have the right conditions to pull off that operation. As I, as I mentioned earlier, we are right now constructing that line. We're making preparations to do a, a small burn operation. Uh, we anticipate that the conditions should be right around Thursday to do that, in which that'll help uh, put that nice buffer around the community of Felton. Yeah. Question for Deputy Clark. Um, can you provide more information in terms of the two people you found, where you found them, and any search effort underway for the uh, other five people? So the question is related to the two people that were found and any additional information about those that are missing. Sure. So uh, in terms of the two people we did find, I, obviously that's through uh, contacting, contact, contacting them directly making contact with them and, and them telling us where they are and, we're, and we make sure that they're all right. With regards to the other people that are missing, there you know we have detectives that are, again, tracking down people that know them, uh, looking for people that may have had contact with them, and then trying to get into the into areas where they may have resided. Uh, and if that area is impacted by fire, it, it, you know obviously we're waiting for that area to be clear before we can get in there to, uh, to do further investigation. Sure. So the question is the role of defensible space in the Bonnie Dune area, and as and is it easily identifiable for firefighters, Chief Brunton? No, absolutely. Uh, Cal Fire is for many years under the Public Resources Code 4291 uh, instituted uh, defensible space inspection program. The importance of defensible space. Uh, a number of years ago, we increased that amount of defensible space based on uh, our fires that we've encountered. That maybe the original intent and, and distance was not enough, so that was increased. Some modifications to that uh, that code uh, established so that we gave better protection uh, to the, the, the structures that we have. Also, building standards. There's been a variety of things. Land use planning uh, the agency has embarked upon and, and working with our, our cooperators 
to improve the survivability of, of the structures in, in our wild and urban interface. So in this particular case, as we see throughout the state and our team is deployed on fires throughout the state, up and down the state, uh, we see a variety of, of, of uh, situations. We see excellent, excellent um, situations where people have done their defensible stage, space, they've done their due diligence, they've done what they need to do, and it gives us a fighting chance whether we're there and at times when we aren't able to be there be because of limited resources of a large fire front early on in the incident that uh, it, it can survive itself. Uh, and then we unfortunately see many times more so than not, a lot of people have not done their due diligence and they do not have the defensible space and the fire will, will take and, and destroy or damage their homes. In this case, the Bonnie Dune, I think you see the full variety of it. You'll see a number of structures that were destroyed that did not have their defensible space. Uh, unfortunately, we saw a lot of that. Talking to the crews that were not only the initial attack companies, but the other uh, folks that, the other responders that were there throughout this incident when things were really um, intense as far as the fire intensity and, and running of the fire, that they were not able to defend a lot of structures because as they went in to assess the structure, they found that people had not done their, their part. The construction types were not conducive to us to, to be successful in battling that structure. So what we have to do at times is we have to make the very difficult decision to triage structures. We have very limited resources, a lot of structures to defend, a fast moving fire front, do the best what we can. So we're gonna take the best opportunity we can based on the best chances. And that's based on those homes that have the best defensible space. And that's where we had successes. And, and you can drive up and down through there uh, and look, and it's very apparent and very clear. Uh, and this is a textbook case of where folks that did their defensible space, those homes are standing today. And, and, uh, and you know, kudos to those folks that did it because now they have a, they have a home standing because they did their part. All right, we have time for about one more question. Chief Deputy uh, Sark, I'm just curious about how many people do you think are still living in evacuated areas overall? And has that number changed since some of the efforts that uh, you were mentioning earlier? And Maybe you could summarize some of those efforts, too. So the question is related to how many people who may still be in the evacuated zone and efforts uh, that are underway. Sure. So, so, you know, going door to door like we did uh, throughout the entire evacuation area, obviously that was a huge task, thousands of homes, uh, three, about 350. I think the number is 347 people uh, we made contact with who said that they would rather ride this uh, fire out than leave. And obviously we encouraged them to leave for, for their safety, but our number was 347. Is that still the case? That is still the case. Now granted, if people didn't answer the door or they're hiding from us, there could be other mitigating circumstances there, but three, uh, 347 uh, different houses told us they wanted to stay put. All right, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, we'll see everybody back here at 6 a.m. tomorrow. This concludes the 6 p.m. press conference.